It's good to see all of you this morning. If you have a Bible with you, I'm going to invite you to take it and open to the book of Hebrews. And we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 2 this morning. Hebrews chapter 2. And while you're turning there, let me just add uh, my word to what Pastor Will said a moment ago about the Protestant Reformation. October 31st in our culture is that day where you have kids knocking on your door asking for candy. And uh, that's a lot of fun. We do trunk and treat and that kind of thing. But there's a much more important reason to mark this day. Uh, Not only is it my grandmother's 90th birthday today, which is a great reason to celebrate. But uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, she's awesome. Um, But October 31st, 1517, uh, a little German monk by the name of Martin Luther marched up to the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. I've been there. He took 95 theses and nailed them to the door and kicked off what has come to be known as uh, the Protestant Reformation. Really, it was a theological revolution because Martin Luther had some beefs with the Catholic Church. And uh, that's what the 95 Theses were about. It was a theological argument, uh, calling out the Catholic Church for some of the ways that they had uh, 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 subverted the truth. So one of the big beefs that Luther had with the Catholic Church had to do with something that you may never have even heard of, but it's called uh, indulgences. Now, you may be, when you hear that word, you may be thinking about your nightly indulgence of bluebell ice cream or something like that. That's not what an indulgence was. Back in the 1500s, the Pope was trying to raise money for some building programs, and so he came up with this great idea. Uh, to, to, in order to raise money to build uh, all of these construction projects, he, he made this deal with the people that if you purchased an in, what was it called an indulgence, then if you had a friend or a family member who was suffering in purgatory, uh, that if you bought an indulgence, it would allow them to uh, get out of hell free card. So the, the phrase went like this, a coin in the coffer rings, a sinner from purgatory springs. <laughs> and... That's an ingenious way to raise money, right? Like if you have friends who are in hell and you want them to get get out, well then give to our building program. That's what the Catholics were doing in the 1500s and Luther had an issue with that. And so he starts railing against this this, uh, subversion of the truth. And he starts, he really has a, a recovery of the gospel, a a, a theological retrieval. And so you may never have thought much about that, but if you believe that we are saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for God's glory alone, all of which can be known through the scriptures alone, then you can thank that little German monk named Martin Luther, because we really have an incredible heritage uh, with the Protestant Reformation as we recovered the gospel, really a retrieval of of the gospel, where your acceptance by God, uh, your salvation is not dependent on you buying an indulgence or you doing any kind of work, but it's simply through faith in Jesus Christ. And there's a, 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 you know, Luther was really captivated by the book of Romans, and the phrase, that the just shall live by faith. And that Catholic monk couldn't get away from that. He, he just worked it over and over in his mind. What does it mean to be saved by faith? And as a result of that, we had the Protestant Reformation, which we are uh, recipients of the, the heritage of those theological truths. And aren't you thankful for it? So here we are in Hebrews chapter 2. Hopefully you've had enough time to find your way Uh, to Hebrews. John Owen once called the book of Hebrews the epistle of warning. The epistle of warning. And that really is what the book of Hebrews is all about. It's written as a warning to Christians who are in danger of turning away from Christ, reverting to their old way of life, giving up on their faith. And the author of Hebrews is writing to this group of new believers to say, don't quit on Christ. Keep running the race. Run the race with endurance, this race of faith that God has put in front of you. Don't quit before you finish. Don't allow your faith to fizzle before the finish line. And so he's warning them not to turn from Christ, warning them not to give up. And that's a really important word for you and for me today because it is so, listen, it is not an easy thing to follow Jesus, is it? It is a hard thing to follow Christ. And we can be tempted to say, you know what, this whole Christianity thing, this whole following Jesus thing just isn't worth the trouble. I'm out. 
And the author of Hebrews is writing to a group of Christians who are right there. They are being tempted with the prospect of, of turning away from Christ. You know, there are a couple of Old Testament stories that I think illustrate uh, exactly the situation of, of the church at Rome, uh, which the book of Hebrews is written to. Uh, you may remember the story of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, this really wicked city. And uh, God has given Sodom and Gomorrah time to repent, and they have not repented. It's just a very evil, very wicked place. And so he's going to pour out his judgment on, that city, uh, on uh, those two cities. But as God always does, he provides a means of escape. He provides mercy and grace, and he gives a, 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 the family of a man named Lot an opportunity to, to get out of the city before he destroys it. And so Lot and his family are rescued, and as they're leaving the city, God begins to pour out his judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. But you'll remember the story, Lot's wife turns back. You remember? She looks back at the city that's being judged, and the Bible tells us that God judged her for that. And <clears throat> that's kind of a crazy thing to think about. I mean, here God had spared Lot and his family, had rescued them from his judgment. They're heading out of the city. What would make her look back? There's another story that you're all familiar with, and it's the story of how God saves the Israelites out of Egypt. You remember they're in slavery for 400 years in Egypt, and so you have the Exodus. God rescues the Israelites out of Egypt, and you would think that the Israelites would be super excited about that, super thankful for rescue, but you know the rest of the story. They get into the wilderness. Life gets a little bit tough, and what do the Israelites start to do? Complain. Uh, they begin to you know, talk about how hot it is out here and how hungry they are out here. And at one point they begin to say, it was better in Egypt. Like I wish we could go back into Egypt, right? Where they were in slavery for 400 years, but it's better back there. And we kind of look at that and we sort of scratch our heads. Like how could they be rescued from slavery and then want to go back? But I've found that actually that kind of experience is often the case with Christians who are rescued from slavery to sin. God takes them out of their old life and they begin to follow Jesus and they start out well and then life gets hard. And at some point they get tempted with their former way of life. And it's very easy like Lot's wife to kind of look back over the shoulder and say, ah, life didn't seem so tough back then. Life seemed to be pretty good back then. Is this whole thing of following Jesus actually worth it? And I think one of the reasons for that, by the way, is because in our culture, the message has kind of gotten out there. I mean, you can just turn on any random Christian TV station and you'll hear people say something like this, that following Jesus will make your life easier. And, you know, if you follow Jesus, then your bank account's going to be full and your cancer's going to be healed and your life is going to be great if you just name it and claim it. And folks, the problem with that is that it's just not the truth. The Bible never says that if you follow Jesus, your life is going to get easier. In fact, it's likely that if you begin to follow Jesus, your life is going to become more difficult in some ways. Your life may look more like a cross, and here's the thing, when you start to follow Jesus and you realize that life is, it's not easy to follow Jesus, that life can throw you some curveballs, that, that maybe your life is beginning to look a little bit more like a cross, it is very easy to be tempted to look back, to consider that old way of life and say, ah, what, is it really worth it? to follow Jesus. And so that is who the author of Hebrews is writing to, a group of Christians who are kind of right in that spot. They've followed Jesus, but they're tempted to go back to their old way of life. And this is a letter warning them not to turn back. And the big reason that the author gives is, is simply this, because Christ is better than your former way of life. That's the big theme of the book of Hebrews. Jesus is better. Christ is superior. You may look back at your old life and think that there's some allure, think that there's something seductive about that, but the author is saying, listen, Christ is worth it. Jesus is better. Jesus is superior. And so that's the whole thrust of the book. Continue to follow Jesus faithfully because Jesus is better. He is worth whatever difficulty you're going through in your life. However difficult it might be to follow Christ, Christ is 
is worth it. Now, the first time that the author really gives a warning uh, not to turn back is in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, which we saw last week. And the author bases that on what he's been arguing about Jesus in Hebrews chapter 1. In Hebrews chapter 1, he's been saying Jesus is superior to the prophets and to angels, right? Prophets and angels are both great. God delivered his word to the Israelites through prophets and angels. But in chapter 1, he's saying Jesus is better than the prophets. He's superior to the angels. The word that he brings is superior to theirs. And so Hebrews chapter 1 is just really an exaltation of Jesus. It's just saying, look at how great Jesus is. He's better than the prophets. He's more than a prophet. He's ranked higher than the angels. And then you come to chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and the author says, so don't turn from him. Don't drift away from him. Realize how great Jesus is and don't drift. And when you come to chapter 2, verses 5 and following, which is what we're going to look at together this morning, the author is going to add sort of an additional layer to his argument. In chapter 1, he says, Jesus is superior to the prophets and to angels, so don't drift from him. Now in chapter 2, verses 5 and following, he's going to add another layer to the argument, another reason that we should not drift from Christ. And the reason is simply this. He's going to argue that you shouldn't drift away from Christ because of Christ's redemptive work. Because of what Christ has done in his redemptive work, what he has done in succeeding where we fail, in suffering for our sin, in being raised from the dead, when you consider the redemptive work of Christ, that is a motivation not to drift away from Christ. Does that make sense? And so we're going to see that in chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. And I want you to see, he's going to, he's going to simply lay this out. He's going to show us how God created each and every one of us with a purpose. How sin has thwarted that purpose. And how Christ regained what sin destroyed. Okay, so in verses 5 through 9, you're going to see the purpose that God created us for. How sin thwarted that purpose but how Christ regains what sin destroyed. And so let's dive into the text together. I want to read verses 5 through 9, and then we're going to walk back through, back through these verses. So chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, he says, Don't drift from the Son of God. Verse 5, For, for God has not subjected to angels the world to come that we are talking about, but someone somewhere has testified. Now he's going to quote Psalm 8. What is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him, that is mankind, humans, lower than the angels for a short time. You crowned him with glory and honor and subjected everything under his feet. Now that's the quote from Psalm 8. Now in the rest of verse 8, the author is going to give commentary on that. For in subjecting everything to him, he left nothing that is not subject, subject to him. But as it is, we do not yet see everything subjected to him. But we do see Jesus made lower than the angels for a short time so that by God's grace, he might taste death for everyone. We see this Jesus crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. So the author is going to tell us God made us with a purpose. Sin thwarted that purpose, but Christ regained what sin destroyed. Now, the first thing I want you to notice that he's arguing here is that God created us with a purpose. What was the purpose that God created us for? Well, we see that. In, in verses 5 through 8, he starts with this statement in verse 5. He says, God has not subjected to angels the world to come. Um, so who, who has he subjected the world to come to? Tell me. Uh, Grant? Jesus, okay. True statement, true statement. God has not subjected the coming world to angels, but to Jesus. But actually, that's not what the, the author is arguing right here. So very close, and it's not untrue, but look at what he says in verse 6. But someone somewhere has testified, what is man 
that you remember him, or the son of man that you care for him. Do you know that God intended the, to subject the world not to angels, but to humans? Now, I, I want to just kind of flesh that out here for a moment. The author is quoting Psalm 8. If you read Psalm 8 in its context, it's written by David. David, you know, was a, a king. Prior to being a king, he was a shepherd. And in Psalm 8, he says, when I consider the heavens, uh, the works of your hands, the stars that God has put into the sky, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? Now, just imagine here David writing Psalm 8 and uh, he's a shepherd, he's out in the field at night, he's got all of his sheep out there, and here's a, a, a star-filled night, and David is just looking up into the sky, and he's saying, wow, when I look at the heavens, when I see all of the stars up in the sky, what is man that God even notices him? Right? I don't know if you've ever been that way on a star-filled night, maybe out in the mountains, and you look up in the sky, and you're like, man, creation is like so glorious. It's so huge. What are we that God would even take notice of us? I, I, uh, I don't know if you've ever been to the top of a, a really tall skyscraper. Not what we have here in Amarillo, but a really tall skyscraper. Amy and I got to go to the Empire State Building a couple of years ago. And from the top of a skyscraper, you have this massive view of the world. And humans down there on the ground, they, they're like little ants. They're really tiny. And that's kind of the sense of what David is saying. He's like, when I consider the heavens, what's man that God even notices him? And there's one way to answer that question, which would be to say, <clears throat> man's not that much. Like when you consider how great creation is, and then you consider little old humans like us, we're pretty small in the grand scheme of things. And we would all say to that, yeah, right, amen, that's, that's right. In, in the grand scope of things, man seems pretty small. But that's actually not where David goes in his train of thought. Notice what he says. He says, what is man, right? When I consider the heavens, the works of your hands, what is man that you take note of him? We might be tempted to say man's not that important. Man's kind of small in, in the consideration of the greater things. But look at, how, look at how David actually answers that question in verses 7 and 8. What is man that you remember him or the son of man that you care for him? I mean, here's the reality. We do seem pretty small in the grand scheme of things, but God does notice us. God does care for us, how can that be? Well, verses 7 and 8 tell us why that is the case. Verses 7 and 8 actually tell us how great humans are and actually the purpose that God made humans for in the beginning. Look at verse 7. You made him a little lower than the angels for a short time, and you crowned him with glory and honor. Now, that's pretty good, folks. David says, look at the heavens, how great they are. What's man that you even notice him? Our temptation is to say man's not, not, not that big of a deal. We're pretty small. But that's not what David says. David says, God made man just a little lower than the angels and crowned humans with glory and honor. That's pretty good. <laughs> what that means is that as a human, you're not unimportant, you are actually the crowning achievement of creation. When, when God creates the heavens and the earth, the center point, the pinnacle of his creative work is mankind. And that's what the, the author is saying here. You might be tempted to think that we are pretty small when you look at the heavens. But in fact, God has crowned us with glory and honor. It, it means that as a human, you're pretty special. And that doesn't take any, anything away from how great God is. It, it's just to say that you are really the pinnacle of God's creative work as a human. Now, let me ask you this. Who wears a crown? Kings, queens, rulers. It's interesting that the quotation here in Hebrews 2 of Psalm 8, the author is saying that God created you to be crowned, to be a, a ruler, to be a king or a queen of creation. In fact, that's exactly what it says in verse 8. 
and subjected everything under his feet. For in subjecting everything to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. What the author is doing here is not just recounting Psalm 8, but he's actually recounting Genesis chapter 1. Do you know that your purpose, God created you to rule over the world. Did you know that? Look at your teenage son or daughter. <laughs> Look at your toddler in your house and realize that God created them with a grand purpose. Yes, that college student that lives in your basement, you're not sure if they're ever going to finish. God created them with a great purpose, the purpose for which God created every human was to rule over the world. Are you skeptical? Stick your finger in Hebrews 2, flip back to Genesis chapter 1. I want to show you this. This is actually part of why God made you. Genesis chapter 1. And, and I just want to read verses 26 <clears throat> through 28. Okay, God creates the whole world. The last thing that he makes is mankind. Okay, men and women, humans. And look at what he, it says in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and following. It says, Then God said, let, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will what? What does it say there? Rule. Who rules? Kings, queens. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. What's the next word? and subdue it. Who subdues things? Kings and queens. We're created to be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth, and then what's the next word? Rule, the fish, the birds, everything that crawls on the earth. This is telling you that God actually created men and women as bearers of his image to reflect his rulership in the earth. God is king of the universe. He makes a world called earth. He puts mankind on that earth and gives them a purpose, a task, which is to rule over it. He, he intended for the whole world to be subjected under our feet. Now, that's quite a big deal, folks. That means that God intended for us to rule the creation, to be good stewards, to be vice regents, if you will, under his authority, to steward the creation, to take dominion, to subdue the earth, to rule over all things. You were made to be a king or a queen. You were intended, God's purpose for you was to be a good steward over all he Made. And that's what he's saying here in Hebrews chapter 2. What is man that you take notice of him? Well, guess what? Man is the one that God created to be crowned with glory and honor, to have everything subjected under your feet. That means that every single one of you was made by God with an incredible purpose. And I, I have flies in the face of what our culture is saying right now, that you are just an accumulation of molecules, that, that you have no purpose, that this is some big cosmic accident. The Bible shouts otherwise. You were made on purpose. And God created you with a big purpose, to rule over the world. That means, by the way, let me just take a little side street here, a little rabbit trail, all right? I'm a Baptist. I can do that from time to time. That, that means that every single person you ever meet is somebody who has incredible dignity, worth, and value just by virtue of being human. It means every, I love the way C.S. Lewis put it, you've never met a mere mortal. Every single person that you ever meet is somebody that God made with an incredible purpose, that God actually created for the purpose of ruling over the earth as a king or a queen to be good stewards over his creation. It means everyone has dignity, worth, and value and should be treated with respect. That's part of the Christian worldview. That's why God made us as humans, to rule under his kingship, to acknowledge that he's the king of the universe, 
and to rule and steward this creation well. You are someone that God intended to subject the world to. Okay, that's pretty big. That's our purpose. But I told you the text actually teaches us not only what our purpose is, which is to rule over the world, but it also teaches us something else, that sin thwarted man's purpose. Here's the deal. God made us to rule over the world, right? We can see that in Genesis chapter 1. We can see it in Psalm 8. We can see it in Hebrews chapter 2. We're supposed to exercise godly good dominion over the creation. So let me ask you, has that happened? Not exactly. Are we ruling well over the created world? No. And in fact, the author says that very thing in verse 8. Look at what, what he says in verse, verses 7 and 8. He says, he, he crowned man with glory and honor, intended to subject the whole world to man. And yet, verse, the middle of verse 8, as it is, we do not yet see everything subjected to him. The author is saying God intended to subject the world to humans, and yet we don't see the world subjected to humans, do we? God intended for you to rule over the world, and yet we don't see us ruling over the world very well, do we? God created us to be good stewards, to be good rulers of the world, but we, here's what happened. Sin thwarted our purpose. God created us to rule well, but we rejected our role in creation as good vice regents, and instead we rebelled against the king. And what happens is in Genesis chapter 1, God creates men and women, Adam and Eve, to rule over the world. But it doesn't take very long until you get to Genesis chapter 3. And what you find is that men and women abdicated their role. They abdicated the throne. They stepped away from their good purpose. And instead of ruling over creation well and acknowledging God as the ultimate ruler, they wanted to be the only occupiers of the throne. Mankind did not rule well, instead flaunted God's rulership and wanted to rule over things their way instead of God's way. I love the way Jimmy Draper puts it. He says, God created man to be a ruler, but sin conquered him. Instead of being a king, man became a slave. Man was created to be in control, but through sin, he is now controlled Man has become frustrated in his purpose, and it all started when man decided he would try to rule this world by himself. And by that choice, man bowed his knee not to God, but to Satan, and sin conquered man. God created man for dominion, but sin has him dominated. So notice the logical progression in the text. What is man that God even takes notice of him? We're tempted to say man's not that big of a deal. But, but here the author says, no, you really are. God created you with this great purpose to be a king or a queen over creation. The problem is we abdicated that rule. We didn't rule well. In fact, instead of ruling over the world and having the world subjected to us, sin has dominated us. We are now subjects to sin. That's the truth, right? I mean, think about, think about this. Um, <clears throat> sin distorts God's plan, right? If God's plan and purpose for you is to rule well, sin thwarts that. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. It's what continues to happen today. I mean, just think about this. Part of exercising dominion is to build, to create, to explore to reshape the natural resources that God has given us, to create things just like God does. But think about how sin distorts that. Think about just, for instance, science, right? Science is a great way to, to exercise dominion, to rule over the world. We, we learn, we explore, we create, we discover, discover, and we, we've created and we've discovered some great things. We've discovered the atom. That's a pretty cool thing. We've got things like phones, where I can FaceTime my grandma this afternoon for her birthday. That's a pretty awesome thing, right? Now, this is a great evidence of how we've ruled over the world, but, but we haven't really always ruled well, have we? We discovered the atom, but then we created the atomic bomb. We have 
a phone, that's pretty cool. That's a great example of ruling well. But how does sin distort that? Well, this great technology also has great danger that comes with it, right? As we have online pornography and online gambling apps and things of of this nature. Here's the deal. We haven't ruled well. God created us to rule over the world. In reality, we've run things into the ground. We've been ruled over by our sin. We are an empty shell of our true selves. Even the things that we try to rule over, like technology, spin out of control and end up ruling over us. The the reality is, even though God created you and me with a great purpose, we haven't lived up to that purpose. We were created to steward things, to rule over things, and instead, sin has ruled over us. So is there any hope? Is there any hope? Yes, Yes, there's hope. And we have it in this passage. I'm really thankful that we have a verse 9. Because in verse 9, look, here's the progression. God created you with a great purpose to subject everything under your feet. And yet, things are not subjected under our feet. In fact, we're being ruled over. Rather than ruling over creation, we're being ruled over by our sin. And our sin brings death and suffering into the world. And if we're just left at verse 8, we're pretty hopeless. But we have a verse 9. Look at what he says in verse 9. But we see Jesus. Aren't you thankful for that? We were created to have the world subjected to us, and yet it's not subjected to us. Things are ruling over us. Our sin rules over us. Death rules over us. Suffering rules over us. That's bad news, but good news. We see Jesus. And notice what he says. He says, we see Jesus who also was made lower than the angels for a short time so that by God's grace, he might taste death for everyone. This Jesus is crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. This is just simply referring to the redemptive work of Christ. And this is what this verse teaches us. God created us with a big purpose. Sin thwarted man's purpose, but Christ regained what sin destroyed. God created us with a purpose to rule over all things. We were crowned with glory and honor, entrusted with rulership. But we do not see man ruling as he should because mankind is ruled over by sin. But we do see Jesus crowned with glory and honor. Now just track, track this. Here's the deal. God created us to rule. We were made a little lower than the angels for a short time, but our ultimate destiny was to rule over the world. We abdicated our rule. Sin ruled over us instead, and God could have left us to our fate. Like Sodom and Gomorrah, God could have just poured out judgment on us because we we messed things up. But instead, he sent another man who would leave his heavenly throne, submit himself to being made a little lower than the angels for a short time. But unlike us, this man never abdicated his role. He never sought to buck God's rulership in his life. In fact, he's the only one who has ever perfectly submitted to God's rule. Jesus came as the perfect representative man, the better man. We sang about it in the song a moment ago, the true and better Adam to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And as the perfect representative of the human race, Jesus regains what sin destroyed. And the author says, we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor. He never abdicated his role. He never ruled selfishly or sinfully or imperfectly. And he wears the crown The author is simply referring to the fact that you were created to wear the crown. I was created to wear a crown. We were created to be good rulers. Instead, sin has ruled over us. But God loved us so much that he sent his son to succeed where we failed. He lived a perfect life, never rebelled against the king of the universe. And yet, 
suffered in our place, died on the cross for our sin, rose from the dead, and is now wearing a crown. He is now ruling over all things. Whereas sin rules over us, Christ rules over sin. Whereas suffering and death rule over us, Christ rules over suffering and death. And he succeeded where we failed. Now, now notice the pathway to the, to the crown. In the words of Tom Schreiner, the path to the crown was the cross. Do you notice <clears throat> that the author says here in verse 9 that he was made a little lower than the angels for a short time so that by God's grace he might taste death for everyone. And he's been crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. You see, as humans, we can, over, we can only rule over the world like God created us to do when we can rule over death. But none of us can rule over death. Death rules over us. But Jesus came, and although he didn't deserve death, he submitted to death so that by dying, he could dethrone death. I love the book that John Owen write, uh, wrote called The Death of Death in the Death of Christ. He's saying that because Christ was willing to die, he put death to death. And I'm really thankful for that. I mean, this is a mind-blowing thought. We are subjected to death, but death is subjected to Jesus. By dying and then rising from the dead, Jesus dethroned death. And that's the point of verse 9. We see Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. Christ's cross was his victor's chariot. It was through the cross that Christ would wear the crown. And what the author is simply saying is that Jesus, listen, the, the solution to the evil that rules over the world. The solution to sin and suffering is Jesus. He absorbed all of the world's evil and all of the world's sin on the cross. And by dying and then rising from the dead, he put death to death. The dominion that Adam lost, Christ regained. The failure that is in man, our failure to rule over things well, Jesus regained. That's why Paul can say in Romans chapter 5, this contrast that Paul gives between Adam and Christ. He says, through Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin. But through Christ, who is a second Adam, he never sinned. And instead of bringing death into the world, he brings life into the world. He rules over death. And that victory is final. So here's the hope for us today. God created you with a purpose, a big purpose. Be a king or a queen over creation. Sin thwarted that purpose. We didn't rule well. In fact, things got out of hand. Sin ruled over us. But there is one who came and was perfectly obedient to the Father, who ruled over his sin and yet died on the cross to pay the penalty for our failure God raised him from the dead. He now sits on a throne and rules over the whole creation. Folks, that's Christ's redemptive work. And let me just, let me just say one other thing about that. That has some implications for you and for me. Here's one implication. God created us with a purpose, rule over the world, we failed in that purpose. Sin rules over us. Christ came to rule over sin. One of the implications of that is that our failure can be totally forgiven and cleansed. When we fail to live up to our purpose, Christ's redemptive work means that we can be totally, fully, finally forgiven. But there's something more. Not only are our, is our failure forgiven, not only is our sin forgiven and cleansed, our failure to rule well, it, 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 I think sometimes we kind of think about salvation this way, that we've messed up, that when we come to Christ, that God forgives our sin, and then you just sort of go through life until Jesus comes back, and then you live in heaven and kind of float around like an angel, and that's kind of the whole story. <laughs> 
And, and folks, while it is true that Christ forgives our sin, that's not the rest of the story. Not only are you forgiven when you come to faith in Christ, but the Bible promises us more. In, I'm not going to preach verse 10, okay? That's next week. But let me just dip into it for a minute. Look in verse 10. For in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make, now notice this phrase, the pioneer of their salvation. You see that word pioneer? Some of you have a translation that says the author of their salvation. Some of you have a translation that says the forerunner of their salvation. The Greek word there is archegos. You can translate it this way, the captain of their salvation. Jesus is the captain of our salvation. And a captain is a leader, one who goes first, one who leads the way where others follow. That's the idea, CSB translates it, a pioneer, a trailblazer. It's saying that Jesus blazes the trail to glory for us. He is the pioneer. He is the forerunner. He is the captain with others who are following him. What that means is simply this. Here's what we believe. Jesus died on the cross. He rose from the dead three days later. He ascended to the right hand of the Father, which is where he is now, ruling and reigning for eternity. Amen? But here's what I want you to know. When you come to faith in Christ, not only does God wipe away your past sin, but what Jesus did, where Jesus went in going to glory, in reigning on a throne, is where you will go if you're a follower of his. He is a forerunner to glory. He is a pioneer to glory. And we are the ones who follow him into that, which means simply this. If you are a follower of Jesus, not only is your sin forgiven, but one day you're going to die. But like Jesus, you will be raised up from the dead. And what's more, the Bible tells us you will reign with Christ. That's your future. You are going to be a king or a queen to whom the, the coming world is subjected. You are going to be those who reign with Christ for eternity. Isn't that what the book of Revelation teaches us? That we will reign, the saints will reign with Christ forever. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that we will even rule over angels. He says we will judge angels in the world to come. Now you say, Pastor, what does that mean? I have no idea but it sounds pretty dang cool. That's your future as a believer. It's not just that you get your past wiped out. It's that you are a future king or queen, that you will reign with Christ over all things for eternity. You will have something to do in heaven. It's not just that you're going to like buzz around like an angel and float around. You will reign with Christ. Through Christ's work, what the author says in verse 5 can be true. God will not subject to angels the world to come, but to us who rule with and under Christ. In Christ, through his redemptive work, we actually get to live out the purpose that God created us for in the first place which is to rule over all things, to have the world subjected to us under the lordship of Christ. Now, folks, that is a reason not to give up on your faith. Remember, verses 5 through 9 follow verses 1 through 4. Verses 1 through 4 is a warning. Don't drift from Christ. Why? Because through Christ... God will subject the world to you. If you will continue faithful with Christ, then one day you will reign with Christ. And that's a reason not to give up on your faith. It's a reason not to give up on your faith because no matter how hard today is, tomorrow is coming. No, no matter how difficult your walk of faith might be, no matter how 
much of a struggle it might be to continue following Christ, you need to realize what your future is going to look like. If you will continue with Christ, if you continue to run the race with perseverance, one day they will bury you. But that's not the end of the story. Christ is is going to return. The dead in Christ will be raised, and you will be seated with Christ in the heavenlies, reigning with him forever. And if that's your future, then it means you can endure any hardship today. If that's what the future, if, if the future looks like resurrection and ruling with Christ, then you can go through any difficulty today because the hardship of today is not the end. We talked about this in Sunday school. There's no problem that you're facing that a good resurrection won't fix. There's no struggle that you're going through, no loss that is too great that not, will not be upended and overturned and made right when Christ returns. When Christ returns, in the words of Tolkien, everything sad will come untrue. The dead in Christ will be raised. Think about that. Those who were martyred for their faith, those who were faithful to follow Jesus, even to the point of losing their life, Some would look at their grave and say, that's the end. If you go with me to Oxford, England, I can take you to a spot at Oxford where a group of pastors were burned at the stake for their faith. There's a little X on the street. Students are biking back and forth. There's little shops and restaurants along the street. If you didn't know what you were looking for, you'd never even notice it. You'd walk right over it. And some people would look at that little X where Cranmer and the rest lost their lives for Christ and they would say, what a waste. What a waste to lose your life for Christ, to be martyred for your faith. What a waste. You should have turned away from Christ. You should have gone back to your former easier way of life. But they will not be saying that when Jesus returns. When the dead in Christ are raised, when graves are bursting open, and every sad thing comes untrue, and we reign with Christ forever, it will have been worth it all. Amen? Let's bow together. Lord, we pray that you would help us persevere in faith. Help us, like Martin Luther, be willing to take courageous steps of faith. God, protect us from cowardice in the faith where we turn away from Jesus when it gets hard. Lord, help us to see what the future will be like reigning with Christ. We look forward to that day when our purpose that sin thwarted is finally fulfilled because of Christ's work. We are thankful that he regained what sin destroyed. So help us to follow him well. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.